Pastor Reed had reminded us this morning that it was back in 1954 that he first came to Bethany. He's been here a number of times since. And we're delighted to have him back. We're delighted for his ministry, a ministry with which we identify so much in our spirits. He, for those of you who weren't here this morning, he has been for a number of years a pastor with the Christian Missionary Alliance. He's native to Minnesota. He pastored the A.B. Simpson Memorial Church in New York, and now he is involved and engaged in a Bible and missionary conference ministry. And we're glad to have him, and he's going to speak to us now. Thank you. Number one in the series we're bringing was Awakening. Tomorrow you'll be given an outline, and I'd like very much to have you fill it in and keep it. I believe when it's completed, you will have a perspective on this so great salvation. Will you turn now to John chapter 16? John the 16th chapter, and I'd like to read verses 7 to 11. This portion this evening has to do with the second phase of the divine operation, conviction, and hopefully we're going to be able to move on this evening to the third of these steps, as the Pastor Murdoch in Omaha said, stepping up to life, these steps that of the divine operation when God would bring men out of death into life. It's important that we understand them because you will see as we go on that everything that follows builds on all that has preceded. So this evening the theme is conviction. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Let us bow in prayer. Father, we're asking that the Holy Spirit will be the teacher tonight, that our eyes of our understanding will be open, our minds receptive, and that our hearts will retain all that thou would teach us. We ask thee, Father, in and through everything that's said, honor and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we ask it. Amen. What is sin? What is sin? You have to answer the question before you can ever expect to be effective in your ministry and helping people uh, to come under conviction of sin. Now, we are laborers together to, with God. We saw this morning that there are three things we can do for the unconverted. We can live before them as a sample of God's grace. We can intercede for them, and we can witness to them. We spent some time talking about the witness to the unawakened, scriptures that we would use to those that have no sensitivity at all to their need, no awareness of their lostness. You see, before they can become convicted of their sin, they've got to discover that things aren't right. Most uh, people that you meet have already uh, accepted their own plan of salvation. In fact, I'm sure everyone you'll ever talk to has his own plan of salvation. It may be ridiculous, may be ludicrous. I've heard people say, well, God's got a great scales in the sky and he's putting all my good deeds on one side, my bad deeds on the other, and if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, it'll be all right for me. Well, whatever that is, sinners have a plan of salvation, and usually it's it always, if they're sinners, it's the wrong one. And therefore, we've got to re recognize that our responsibility is as a witness to deal with the person we find at the point where we find them. Now, I've had people come to me through the years saying, would you pray for my son, my daughter, my husband, whoever, uh, that they'll be saved? You know, it's an awfully big thing, isn't it, to pray that they'll be saved? 
it's like a mother coming to someone saying, will you pray for my daughter that uh, she'll be married, that she'll get married. Uh, you might want to ask a question. Well, they, does she have any friends? Does she have uh, a, a, someone that she's going with? Is she engaged? Well, instead of praying that the daughter would be married, don't you think it might be, pray, be wise to start praying that she'll become affable and pleasant enough that at least she could have a friend? <laughs> and if that happens, they might be able to move on to another step. And so when you're talking about the unconverted, why should we start in by praying that they'll be, that they'll be saved? Why not ask God if they're unawakened to awaken them? And if we sense they're awakened, don't rush in with, with uh, four questions that are going to lead them to a premature assumption that they're, they're Christians, but pray that God will help you now to use the scripture in such a way as to see them brought to conviction. But if they're going to be brought under conviction, we must understand a little bit about sin. Now, what is it? First, is sin a congenital disease or is it a crime? Are people in trouble because they inherited something from their parents and their grandparents? Or are they in trouble because when they reach the age of accountability, they deliberately turn to their own way? They chose to follow in the path of those before them and that they have confirmed everything that's gone before them by the committal of their will to the principle and the practice of pleasing themselves as the end of their being. Now, sin is a crime. I'm saying that. I don't want to use some elaborate deductive reasoning to get you there. I'm going to tell you, sin is a crime. It is a crime against God. When a mere man determines that he's going to defy the only one in the universe that's wise enough and big enough and good enough to govern and rule his life, climb up into that throne chair in his heart that only God can fill like a little infant in a big chair, a little tiny baby in a chair, and has to cling to the post so he doesn't fall out under the armrest. Here we are, sinners, climb up in the throne of our life and sit there and determine that we're going to do what we want to do. And all the time we're dependent on God for life and breath and all things. Well, sin is not only a crime, it's insanity. It's moral insanity. We saw this morning that sin is treason against righteous government. Sin is open rebellion and defiance of government. Sin leads to anarchy where the only rule is I'm going to do what pleases me. And it, of course, in issues into transgression. When the law of God gets between the individual and his appetite, the means of satisfying it, he forgets all about God's law. The astounding thing is, after all of these crimes against God, you would think God would be the enemy of the sinner. But you know, the scripture says, the carnal mind is enmity against God. In other words, Sinners committed all these crimes against God, and then he turns out to be God's enemy. Well, if that's it, then you've got to understand that we've got to have conviction of sin. Now, in the years when I was here in training in Minneapolis, I did quite a bit of work in jails, a little later on in prison. And I gathered from the people I talked to on the other side of the bars that at least in Minnesota, the miscarriage of justice is almost 100%. Now, all these folks were there. They were all imprisoned. But I only think once that I ever met anybody that, according to him, was there justly. I remember asking one fellow, why are you here? And he said, because I deserve to be here. In fact, I deserve to have been killed for my crimes. But they were merciful, the court was merciful, and I'm here on a life sentence. But I'm here because I deserve to be. Now, that's the only time, and you'd think, wouldn't you, that there might be somebody else in jail that was there because he deserved to be. But all the people I talked to had been uh, uh, sentenced, but in their own minds, they weren't convicted. Now, what is conviction? 
It is that state of the mind and heart when the individual takes sides with God against himself. Now the word says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But conviction is the work of the Spirit of God on the human heart that causes the individual to realize at least something of the enormity of the crime that's been committed. I'd like to give you some illustrations. I'm going to ask you to turn. I want you to use your Bible. Will you turn to Genesis chapter 42 and verse 21? I would like to have you see with your own eyes something wonderful that happened in the life of these the brethren of, of Joseph. Joseph is in Egypt. And in verse 8 it says, And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, You are spies to see the nakedness of the land you are come. And they said unto him, Nay, my Lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land you are come. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. And Joseph said unto them, You are spies. And how be it you prove it now? You, you just bring your brother down here. And in verse 21, and they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. These brethren that so arrogantly and haughtily sold Joseph into slavery now have come to the place that they're under conviction and they've taken sides with God against themselves. We are verily guilty. Now that's conviction when the sinner takes sides against himself. You might want to turn over to Numbers chapter 21 and verse 7, and you'll see another instance when, when this has happened. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for them. Perhaps you'd like to turn to Ezra. There's another instance. Ezra in the ninth chapter in the sixth verse. Where the God in the old, the God of the Old Testament, you know, is the same as the God of the New Testament. And he has given to us these testimonies here that we might understand them. Ezra 9, verse 6. And said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities have increased over our head and our trespasses is grown up into the heavens. Since the days of our father have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hands of the kings of the land, to the sword, to captivity, and to spoil, and to confusion as it is this day. Conviction of sin. Well, why? Why should it happen in this way? Why should we have to have such an awful uh, work of the Spirit of God to produce conviction? I heard a preacher just a week or two ago say, never preach the law. God is love. Just talk to sinners about the love of God. Everybody knows they've sinned. 
But how interesting it is to read in Romans that the law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And by the law is the knowledge of sin. I don't know how I can give up the word of God to accept the metaphysics of certain preachers that think that because God is holy, it's a blot on his escutcheon, a blemish on his character. And so when I heard this man say that, I said, no, I'm going to stake with the word. And the word says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. How then are people brought to conviction of sin? How does it occur? What's the, what happened? If you haven't read it, I urge you to get the book Gospel Themes, uh, sermons that were preached by Charles G. Finney. And in one of these messages, uh, Finney talked about the inner revelation and the outer revelation. Now, when my wife and I went to Africa back in 1945, we had just the customary training that you'd get in a very fine Bible school. And so we didn't have very high expectations as to what the people that had never seen a missionary or heard the name of Jesus knew. But when I went into the Ganza tribe along the Sudan-Ethiopian border, who said I was the first one ever to come with the Bible, first one ever to mention to them the name of Jesus, I found out that these people knew an amazing amount, far more than I'd ever been led to expect they knew. For instance, they knew God had made the world. All you had to do was break off a stick or pick up a stone or anything and say, who made it? And they gave you the name. In this case, it was Wanamish and that he was holy and he was angry with them because of their sin. All they also knew about Satan, that he was evil, that he was bad. Now, they didn't sacrifice to God, to Wanamish. Uh, why don't you bring your chickens to Wanamish? And they said, we don't even know that he wants chickens. We can't waste them on him if we don't know that's what he wants. We know that if we don't take our chickens to the evil spirits, our goats will die and our crops won't mature. And so we got to save all the chickens we got for the ones who want them, for the evil spirits. So uh, they knew that, that God was, but there was no fear of God before their eyes. Oh, they knew he was going to punish them when they died. But uh, they were so worried about how to survive till the harvest that they couldn't be protected particularly concerned about what was going to happen when they died. Now, I began to say they, they knew God was angry with them because of what they had done, was the way they put it. Well, what have you done that he's angry with? And they said, well, we've lied. Have you ever heard of that? I mean, it seems somewhat familiar to Ten Commandments, doesn't it? And, uh, and what else have you done? Well, we've stolen. He doesn't want you? No. We can't steal. Well, have you stole? Oh, yes. And what else? Well, you can't kill. And I remember turning to one man, have you ever killed? He said, are you with the government? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm, I'm here just to study your language and talk to you about Jesus. Yeah, I've killed. And so is he, and so is he, and so is he. Accusing one another, you know, he didn't want to be all alone there. Now, they knew it was wrong to lie and to steal and to kill. Now, who taught them? They'd never seen the Bible. they never heard the name of Jesus. They never had introduction to Ten Commandments. Say, so how in the world would they know that? Well, you might be surprised. In uh, Romans, the second chapter, uh, Paul writes saying, when the Gentiles, that's the pagans, people I talk to, who have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, and show that they have a law, the law is written on their hearts. You see, 
every model of the human family that's been come off the assembly line, everybody that's ever been born of human parents, is standard equipment. And the standard equipment for a human being is the law written on the heart. Now, I referred to this marvelous sermon by Charles Finney. Now, he used uh, an illustration appropriate to his day. In his day, flour mills consisted of having a big stone that had had lines cut in it, grooves cut into it, and they had a, a means with a water wheel so that the one, the lower stone would go one way, and then there was an upper stone, and it would go the other way. Now, it's hard for you to get you to do your hands. You might want to try it. It's hard to get one hand going one way and the other and keep them going. It won't work. But you get it with, with, with millstones. And so what Finney said was this that when you bring the outer revelation of the law in the word to bear upon the inner revelation written on the heart, the human spirit is caught between and is ground, uh, that is the hull is taken off, the sophistication is taken away, and they're brought under conviction of sin. Now, the upper millstone is the law written, and the lower millstone is the law in the heart. And this is why wherever we go, any place in the world, you can always bring the revelation of the holiness of God and the law of God down upon the person that's there, knowing that the Spirit of God is going to cause that preparation of the heart for grace. You see, without that upper millstone lowered, the conduct just rests on the lower millstone and it just rides around and there's no abrasion and no pressure, no friction, and they're content. But when you bring the Word of God down and the human spirit is there and human conduct is there and it begins to be ground, now you see why it says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. And the law gives, the, gives to sin the character of exceeding sinfulness and transgression. And it's therefore imperative that we learn how to use the law in such a way that it is going to cause the human spirit to undergo this work of being shredded and, 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 rig, and, and ripped and, and crushed and, and ground. Now, just as we gave you verses having to do with awakening, so I'm asking you to do your homework and to gather for yourself verses that you find congenial to your mind and your spirit that you're going to use with people that have been awakened, but are not yet under conviction. And one of the good places to start is with the Ten Commandments. How many of you learned them when you were children in school, Sunday school? Well, how many of you remember them all? You can pass the test on them. If I were you, I'd go back and do a little refreshing on that because you'd be astonished the way the Spirit of God is pleased to use the revelation of the holiness of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as it's given there in the Ten Commandments. That's the law. But the law is not restricted to it, of course. Everything that indicates the holiness of God is, in effect, that teaching, that Torah, that unveiling of the heart to the individual. Now, some of the effects of the law applied to the conscience are, are unrest, distress, uh, concern, uh, 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 just unhappiness. Something's the matter. I'm not getting any pleasure out of this anymore. Unrest will give way to a burden, just sort of something we call it, you psychologists call it depression. 
but it's a burden on the mind and on the spirit. And a lot of people that are depressed try to escape from it, uh, thinking that it's something they shouldn't have when it's the spirit of God dealing with them about their sin. In Psalm 51, 3, David talked about misery. His sin was ever before him, and it caused misery in his heart. In Acts, we're told that they had the sting of conscience. Their, their, their minds were stung by what they heard from Peter. In Acts 24, 35, 25, we are told that uh, terror struck their hearts. All of these things accompanied by conviction. Probably one of the best in illustrations of a convicted person is that publican that went down to the temple and stood there in front of the veil of the temple and, uh, and beat his breast with downcast eyes, the Pharisees on one side and the other saying, thank God we're not like this fellow is. And uh, the publican is crying out, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Inside the other side of that veil is the mercy seat where the blood is taken once a year by the high priest and he's in the right place and he's in the right attitude he's taken sides with God against himself he's under conviction of sin no that's got to happen that has to happen with sinners and you should when you find an awakened sinner not lead him to a premature uh, assumption that because he has an intellectual agreement with the plan of salvation uh, that he can therefore just automatically uh, assume that, that he's a Christian. Conviction is real. Now there's a good reason for it. God has a reason why he said that the Holy Spirit would convict of sin. Because his purpose, you know, wasn't to just give us a hell insurance policy. His purpose was to save us from our sins. And until we can discover what they are, we're really not candidates to be saved from them. I asked a group of people one time years ago, uh, about 94 present, how many of you have been say, are saved? And every hand went up. We were having an evangelistic meeting. Ninety-four people weren't able to get one unsaved person into the meeting. They'd want to have an evangelistic meeting, but they weren't able to get one person in. Now I said, how many of you have ever been lost? And four hands went up. And it amazed me. It's the first time, I don't think I'd ever asked that sequence of questions before, but I went ahead and said, how in the world is it that you can be saved when you've never been lost because the only kind of people that he saves are lost people. He came to seek and to save that which was lost and only four of you ever remember being lost and all 94 of you claim that you're saved. Now, either the word is wrong or your memories aren't correct or you're wrong. Something isn't coming out the way it ought to be because if you're truly born of God, it shouldn't be too difficult for you to remember when you were lost. Certainly wasn't hard for me. I went down to old Red Rock Holiness Camp meeting in South St. Paul, Minnesota, because my mother was teacher of a girls class in Heron Methodist Church, and one of the girls was gonna go down there, and I wanted to be where she was, and two <laughs> weeks was, seemed pretty good. But I had to go to services and three times a day. Now, I mean, they didn't kid around. You went morning and afternoon and evening. And I had to change to go. I, mean, I had to wear a suit. Now, I was about 12 years old, 13 maybe. And I had a suit, a cheviot suit. You know what cheviot is? Well, they learned how to make cheviot from the Iron Maiden that had spikes in it. Uh, I think it's half horsehair and half barbed wire. At any rate, I had a Cheviot suit, and I would go and sit there, and I tell you, I never went to sleep. I never even sat down. I was about a half inch off the seat. 
And these preachers, my, there, were, there were giants in the land those days. There was Paul S. Reese and, uh, and, and Dr. John L. Brasher and Joseph Owens, all great holiness preachers. Well, I was a church member and I was uh, all right. Except long about Friday or Saturday of the first week, I reached the conclusion that there were two kinds of Christians, the kind I was and the kind they were talking about. <laughs> and about Sunday night, I realized that I, I wasn't saved, but I could never tell anybody because my mother thought I was, and she'd be so disappointed if she found I wasn't. And about Wednesday night, no, I hadn't slept. I'd gone home. I knew I was lost. I knew that if God didn't have a hell and I died, he'd have to make one because if I went to heaven the way I was, I'd ruin the place. <laughs> a sermon preached by Paul S. Reese. Paul Reese preached, and now what a glorious exaltation of Christ. And then he stopped. We were singing, Just As I Am. He said, For the last three nights, I haven't been able to sleep. I've been waking up in the middle of the night because praying for somebody that came on the grounds thinking they were saved, and they found out they're lost. I don't know who it is, but as I've prayed, it seems to me I've seen in my mind a boy, maybe 12 or 13, something like that, thought he was here. Maybe somebody else, but that's what I think. Now, friends, you're standing there. You look down your aisle. If you see somebody holding on to the bench in front of him, probably that's who it is. Boy, I dropped that bench like it's hot. As I looked, I was the only one that I could see anywhere holding on to the bench in front of me. Well, they sang the next verse, and I headed for that altar in the straw. And I remember when I knelt there, the whole place was full. And they had three quartets from three holiness colleges, John Fletcher College, Asbury, and Taylor. Now, John Fletcher was the least of the colleges, and the bass was the least of the four singers. And so I got the least man from the least college. Everybody else was with somebody. And I'm over there at this end of the altar, all the way at the end, and so I heard somebody say, well, won't somebody go over to that boy over there? And I said, you, you go over there, would you? And this fellow came over and he, he said, what would you come for? I said, to be saved. He said, from what? I said, I didn't know I had a choice, from sin. <laughs> he says, how do you know you need to be saved? I said, because I'm lost. And he said, ah, that's good. And I looked at him right square in the eye and I said, maybe you think so, but I'm not finding it so good. Why do you say it's good? He said, because the only kind of people God saves are lost people. And if he can't get them lost, he can't get them saved. He said, now what I want you to do is I'm going to keep people from bothering you. And you just go down there and you go into your mind and memory and you ask God to recall to you every sin you've ever committed. And you bring it out and you pile it right here in front of you. And when there aren't any more, you tell God, if he'll tell you what the others are that you haven't remembered yet, you'll put them on the pile too. And he said, when you finish, then I want you to... Start thanking God that he sent his son to die for sinners as bad as you. You got some idea how bad you were by that time. And I did just what he said. And after a while thanking him that he died for sinners like me, I found something had happened. And you know what it was? I was saying, dear Father, thank you for saving me. He bore witness with my spirit that I passed from death to life, but I was lost. And I don't believe people ever come to the assurance of forgiveness till they're lost. Now, the next thing, number three in our list, is repentance. I want you to see that. I think perhaps we can get pretty well along with that. 
this evening. Conviction is issues into something we call con repentance. We're commanded to repent. In Ezekiel 18.31, we're commanded to repent. In Hosea, in Joel, John preached it. In Luke 13, 3 and 5, the Spirit of God moves again upon us as the Lord Jesus' words are recorded. Except you repent, you'll perish. But I found an awful lot of nonsense about the subject of repentance. In fact, I hear a lot of preachers talk about it or write about it, and they make the way they, they handle it. You'd think that repentance means uh, being sorry for sin. I've even heard them say, sorry for sin, sorry enough to quit. Well, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Should we? I think it's worthwhile. Just take a look at it and see what this thing sorrow does in reference to sin. 2 Corinthians 7, beginning with verse 8 through verse 11. Paul said, For though I made you sorry with a letter, that's the first letter to the Corinthians, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle has made you sorry, though it was were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now we've had repentance used one way or another. What's it mean? Well, the Greek word, I'm told, means to change one's mind, to change one's mind from something to something. Now, remember we were talking a few moments ago about the, what is sin. And I said, sin is a crime. Sin is the committal of the will to the principle and the practice of governing one's life to please himself. In other words, when the scripture says all have sinned, what it says is reaching the age of accountability, everyone, everyone has chosen to govern and control their lives and please themselves. Now, the church got into an awful lot of trouble because uh, some fellows way back when, like Augustine, uh, tried to answer the question that the Bible never answered. The Bible doesn't tell us why everybody sins. It just tells us that everybody sins. Now, the moment that you try to go beyond the Scripture, you're in metaphysics. Or you're in philosophy. And it behooves us to stay in the Scripture. Now, the Scripture does not tell us why everybody sins. There's a lot of theories floating around. But I'm going to stick with the Word of God. And you ask me, well, why did everybody sin? I don't know. And I don't think anybody else does. Because God never told us why. He tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And just between you and me, I got enough problem with the things he has told us that I can't spend a lot of time worrying about the things he hasn't told us. And he never told us why, but he did tell us that. Reaching the age of accountability, every one of us chose as the principle by which we would live, I am going to do what I want to do. Now, maybe... Some were far more refined and cultured than others, and they didn't put their fist in the face of God and say, I'm going to do what I want to do. They may have just said, well, I'm going to do what I really want to do. I mean, I don't care whether they're up and out or down and out. The fact is the Scripture says they're out. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. And whether they did it with gritting teeth and set jaw and shaking fist or whether they just did it all nice and sweet and refined and cultured, they still did it. And it's an equal treasonous crime, well, however, whatever their attitude was, 
when they did it. So the mindset of the sinner is, I am going to do what I want to do. I'm going to govern and control and rule my life. Now the Lord Jesus said in Luke 13, 3 and 5, except you repent, you're going to perish. Now let me stop a little. When I was here in Bible school, we were told that repentance had nothing to do with the age of grace. I was uh, taught dispensationalism. Now, friends, let me say this. Dispensationalism is like pregnancy. There's no such thing as a little bit of it. You just, you get it, you, it's gonna grow, it'll fill you. And, uh, and it took hold on me. And when my, one of my colleagues said, brother, I think there is something to this thing about repentance to sinners. I said, now whatever you do, don't try to get me mixed up in that. Repentance is Jewish and it has nothing to do with the age of... Now, I told him that after I'd come back from Africa as a missionary. Because I'd been really... Well, I, I was... When I finished with me, I, I was like Lazarus when he came out of the tomb. He was alive, but man, was he ever wrapped up. Was he bound? And so was I. And I, when I found out someone dared to believe that repentance was for today, you know who set me straight? Another dispensationalist. That's right. By the name of Harry A. Ironside, then pastor of Moody Church in Chicago. The American Tract Society had a contest in a $1,000 reward or a prize for the book that was chosen for that year. And you know, Harry Ironside wrote a book and submitted it, and it was chosen, and the title was Accept Ye Repent. It's out of print, and it ought to be reprinted, and ought to be distributed, and made cheap enough that you could get it everywhere. Because he said, I take umbrage with my dispensational friends that try to tell me and tell others that repentance is not for today because... The scripture makes it clear that Paul said he was in, when he was in Ephesus night and day among the Jews and the Gentiles preaching repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I believe that when the dispensationalists took out the law of God away from preparing hearts for grace, to bringing conviction and repentance. They did a, committed a greater crime against the glorious Son of God than all of the modernist enemies put together have ever done against the Lord Jesus Christ. Because they disarmed the Holy Ghost with the only instruments with which he'd ever provided himself to prepare men for grace. Men have to be convicted of sin and they must repent because Christ said, except you repent, you'll perish. Now what does it mean to repent? A change of mind. What's the mindset of the sinner? I'm going to do what I want to do. What's a change of mind? A change from what it's been to what it should have been. 180 degree change. Well, I'm gonna do what I wanna to do to the Lord. I'm gonna please you and serve you as long as I live. Now, that's repentance. A change of mind, a change of intention, a change of purpose, and a change of practice. And it has no merit with it doesn't earn anything. You're not doing any works. All you're doing is just bringing sinners to realize the enormity of their crime, that they have lived to please themselves and gratify their appetites, and now they're going to change. They're not striking a deal with God. They're not trying to make any kind of a bargain. They're simply saying from today on, the purpose of my life is to please God. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, when he was pastor at the great Metropolitan Tabernacle, preached a sermon on repentance. It was a great sermon from the Psalms. And he said, repentance to be real has to be hearty 
and not reluctant. It's done because one's discovered that God deserves to be obeyed and served. It has to be voluntary and not induced or, co or coerced. It has to be something the person does because he wants to do it because God deserves it. God deserves to have him obey him and serve him. And then the third thing Spurgeon said of, of a total of six was this. It has to be complete and not partial. He said if a person had a thousand sins and he repented of 999 of them, there was no real repentance. All it was was trying to strike a bargain with God. Has to be complete and not partial. What's it mean? A committal of the will to the principle and the practice of pleasing God in everything from that time on. And it's a prerequisite to forgiveness. It's a prerequisite to pardon. And it's what we've got to tell every sinner to whom we speak that's a candidate for grace. That's discovered their lostness. Now this is what the scripture says, you've got to repent. And that means that from today on, he's going to be king and boss and sovereign. You're going to do what he tells you to do just because he deserves to be obeyed and to be served. Well, I think that we need to understand that, that we need to proclaim it. I never thought I'd live long enough to see a famine for the hearing of the Word of God. You know, you can preach from the Bible all your life and never preach it. And I believe that the lost, one of the lost notes in modern preaching is, at first, the law of conviction, the law used to bring conviction and leading to repentance. It's so important, it's absolutely imperative that we should understand this. We should realize this. Now tonight, I come to the conclusion and the close of the message and I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been lost? Have you ever discover your lostness, the enormity of your crime against God? Have you repented? Have you changed your mind about who's to be boss? Have you purposed in your heart to please God in everything? That's the nature of repentance, a change of mind, a change of intention, and a change of purpose. Now, maybe you say, well, I did, but there's some things that have come along. You know, if I were you, I wouldn't go out that way. I'd come this way, and I'd meet God and bring everything up to date. If there's anything the Spirit of God spoken to you about, the course of wisdom is to deal at the time God shows you. We always have an invitation whenever I've been here, Bethany. It's always been this. If you're willing to confess every sin and believe that what you confess, he forgives, and if you're willing to surrender absolutely everything to his will and believe that what you surrender, he receives, then we invite you to come talked with and prayed with. Now, as I said this morning, I don't give long invitations because I believe that anyone who's discovered they have a need has got sense enough, wisdom enough to deal with it at the time they find it out. And so we're going to bow in prayer, and if God is speaking to your heart, then we're going to ask you to when, when the singing or music plays or whatever, or right now, as far as that goes, we're going to ask you to just come, mind God. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we're so concerned about the world around us. Oh, we're so concerned about the people that are being misled on the most important subject in all the world. They're never dying souls. And we're asking that somehow thou by thy sweet and marvelous grace will breathe upon us. Show us the importance of these phases of thine operation on sinner folk awakening them and convicting them, bringing them to repentance. Not to be hard on them, but that they might, they might come to life. They might come to life in Christ. And should there be some here today, Father, in this meeting, surely in a company this large are those that do have need. And others, Father, who 
discovered that that purpose to please thee in everything has been forgotten in some instances. And so, Father of Jesus, just now, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, we're asking that thou will breathe upon us. Oh, breathe upon us, breath of God. And let decisions be made tonight that will be to the eternal glory of Jesus Christ. We ask, Father, in the peerless, matchless name of thy lovely Son, our Lord Jesus. Amen.